G'day, I'm Rowan Mackey and welcome to Individuate, the podcast where we use the vehicle of starting our own podcast to try and get the best out of ourselves in the service of others. Today, we've got a bit of a different episode again. We're going to be looking at the life of one of my all-time favourite people. Because with all that we've learnt in the last few weeks, there's so much that we can gain from his life that we can take in pursuit of our own goals. Regardless of what we want to do, there's so much in this person's life that can give us insight into how to better perform in our chosen field or profession, and of course, for our podcast. It struck me over the last couple of episodes how much of an emphasis there was on finding a creative community or finding a mastermind group. I know this is something that James Whitaker has been able to do incredibly well, and so it was great to get an insight into some of his philosophies and techniques last week. But one thing that strikes me about finding our creative community or mastermind group is we've got to be able to bring something to the table ourselves in order to be of value to others. So that's what we'll continue to focus on in the next couple of weeks because there's a few more layers I want to add before moving on too much. So today, in order to do that, I'm going to be looking at the life of one of my all-time favourite people, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo is one of those people who are so utterly famous that you don't actually recall first learning about them. But when I think people are as famous and spoken about as Leonardo, it can lead us to build up a bit of a mythology around them. Leonardo, for instance, is almost seen as this superhuman who is seemingly transported from years ahead of his time and called upon abilities that us mere mortals simply don't possess. But I think in demystifying the life and professional development of someone like Leonardo, we can be empowered. You realise that our similarities with these people are in fact much greater than our differences. Before we really get into today's episode, this is a bit embarrassing, but I've actually got to make a correction from episode 9. Thank you to Glenn from Dublin for pointing this out, but I said a psychological prototype was something that abstracts the fundamental property of something. Of course, a prototype is something that is the best representation of a fundamental property, and you make the abstraction from there. So today, for example, we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci, who you could argue is the prototype of a Renaissance painter. I must admit, my favourite Renaissance artist is Tiziano Vecellio, better known as Titian. But as we'll find out today, I think it's interesting how we've come to remember Leonardo da Vinci, because to me, he was so much more than a painter, or even an artist. Leonardo was born in rural Tuscany in 1452. His father was a successful legal notary and his mother the daughter of a farmer in Vinci. Born as an illegitimate child, with his parents being out of wedlock, he was unable to take his father's name and so was given the name Da Vinci to signify the place of his birth. Young Leonardo spent his earliest years with his mother, but around the age of five was taken to live with his father and his father's family, who, although affluent, spent no money on Leonardo's formal education. Little is really known of Leonardo's childhood, apart from the fact that he was fascinated by nature at a young age. But I think it's worth looking at some of the circumstances Leonardo grew up in to get a sense of where some of his philosophies would have developed that would go on to serve him so well in later life. Leonardo's father, Piero, had four wives. The first two died childless. However, Piero had six children with his third wife and six children with his fourth wife. All 12 of Leonardo's half-siblings would have legitimate claims to their family's wealth and titles. However, Leonardo never got this opportunity. Then this all contributed to the internal code that Leonardo developed throughout his childhood and adolescence. His lack of status led him to develop an attitude that would serve him greatly throughout the rest of his life. He vowed to always push beyond expectations and past all obstacles. It's fascinating to see how this philosophy plays out in later life, but I think it at least partly came from the limitations that were placed on him by the circumstances surrounding his birth. It's as if in experiencing such arbitrary invalidation for something outside of his control, he vowed to be the absolute master of everything that was within his control that was to follow. Although he didn't receive a formal education, young Leonardo was fascinated by nature One of his only written childhood recollections is of exploring the mountains and coming across a cave. He was both terrified of any monster that might lurk in the cave, but also driven by an insatiable curiosity to find out what was inside. 
It was largely due to this incredible curiosity for the natural world that enabled Leonardo to become the adult he grew up to be. But we'll have a bit more about that later on. Unable to inherit his father's name or property, Leonardo knew that his best option of escaping a life of poverty was to become a craftsman and join one of Florence's artists' guilds. Essentially, these guilds were professional trade unions, and they had quite a bit of power around Florence. For an artist, membership to one of these guilds allowed someone to gain an apprenticeship and eventually commissions for their artwork. Because he was an illegitimate child, Leonardo was unable to join one of these guilds, but his father was able to secure him an apprenticeship with Andrea del Verrocchio, one of Florence's master painters of the time. This means that he had one chance to be something in life. He relied solely on his talent. Either he'd become great and be accepted into higher society, or he'd be mediocre and live a life of relative discomfort. Verrocchio's workshop was a centre for Christian humanist thought and culture in Florence in the 1400s. It's interesting to note that Leonardo joined Verrocchio's workshop around the time of Verrocchio's master's death, who just happened to be the world-famous sculptor Donatello. He's come up on this podcast before. So it's clear that although he wasn't able to receive the status of his siblings, Leonardo had a pretty first-class education when it came to being an artist. Now, there's entire books written on Leonardo's life, including by people who were alive at the same time as he was. So I'm not going to go through an entire biography of Leonardo, but there's a couple of important things to note from Leonardo's time with Verrocchio, because they were obviously formative years for Leonardo. Verrocchio was not just an artist, but an incredible innovator, and his influence on Leonardo was substantial. Firstly, I think it's important to note that Verrocchio was much more than our modern idea of a painter. The commissions that artists would receive in Renaissance Italy may have been paintings, but also things like bronze or marble sculptures. The commission could have been to cast a big bronze bell or create a giant door. Although fine art was one activity that the painters would have to gain a mastery over, it was just one of the many different media. They would have also experienced both theoretical and practical training. The artists in Verrocchio's workshop would have been painters, but by our modern standards, there would have also been sculptors, architects, draftsmen, engineers, biologists, theologists, psychologists, mathematicians and scientists. Then, they would have to be proficient in engineering and mechanical design in order to create the scaffolding needed to get up high enough to paint or create an apparatus robust enough to hold up something like a giant heavy bronze bell. For example, one of the major projects that took place whilst Leonardo was working in Verrocchio's workshop was to create the giant ball that sits at the top of the Duomo Cathedral in Florence. Despite falling down once or twice, it's still there today. In order to elevate the giant ball, Verrocchio and his artists had to create a series of machines that could lift the heavy object up to the incredible height of the top of the Duomo. Some speculate that it was in this project where Leonardo first developed a love of engineering and construction that would underpin much of his later career. Another point to note about this time for Leonardo is that he basically covered off the first three of Alan Gannett's laws of the creative curve that we spoke about in episode 9. Leonardo became a master during his apprenticeship, and accounts suggest that his talent was remarkable and immediately evident relative to his peers. Verrocchio's workshop contains some of the most well-known artists from the Renaissance, and so his creative community would have been incredibly dynamic. For example, Botticelli, who painted the incredibly famous Birth of Venus, was just a couple of years older than Leonardo, and was also apprenticed in Verrocchio's workshop. This environment would have been an absolute goldmine for a young artist in the early Renaissance, and although Leonardo was clearly a star pupil, he would have been influenced and motivated by many other artists learning and growing around him. That being said, it was apparently clear Leonardo's star shone the brightest. There's a story about Leonardo when working in Verrocchio's workshop. At that time, Verrocchio's apprentices would have done most of the painting in the workshop, and one of Leonardo's famous collaborations with his master is for Verrocchio's painting, The Baptism of Christ. It was Leonardo's job to paint the young angel to the right of Jesus, who was holding his robe. Leonardo painted the angel in such a way that it was far superior to that of his master, and it's said that upon seeing how well Leonardo had done, 
Verrocchio put down his brush and never painted again, recognising that anything he ever did would be inferior to his young apprentice. It's unknown whether this story actually occurred just like this, but Leonardo is quoted as saying, Poor is the pupil who does not surpass his master. So it's clear that at the very least, he placed incredibly high expectations of excellence on himself. It's said of Leonardo's time with Verrocchio that he mastered everything that he tried. I've got a theory as to why this is, but a little more about that later on. At 20 years of age, in 1472, Leonardo completed his apprenticeship with Verrocchio and was accepted into the Guild of St. Luke, which was the union for artists and doctors in Florence. Interestingly, however, although he was able to now go out on his own, Leonardo stayed with Verrocchio, even though he recognised himself to have surpassed his master's ability and is now seen as one of the single greatest geniuses of all time. He didn't yet feel ready to start up his own shop, and so he continued working with Verrocchio for the next few years. Fast forward now to 1478. Leonardo is 26 and Florence is on the brink of war after the Pope excommunicates Lorenzo de Medici, Florence's leader and Leonardo's patron. Faced with the imminent destruction of his hometown at the hands of foreign forces, it's at this time that Leonardo began his long love affair with war machines. Leonardo began to design ladders defence fortifications and other weapons of war in order to defend Florence from the impending army if it was needed. Fortunately, Lorenzo de' Medici was able to broker a peace deal and the threat to Florence was no longer there. Leonardo had got a taste for military engineering, however, and wasn't satisfied with going back to his old life as a painter. It's here that we really get a glimpse into the personality of Leonardo. You could argue that he only became an artist in order to gain a certain status in society. But once he had achieved this, he wanted to pursue other passions and not just be known as a painter. Around this time, Leonardo received his first large individual commission, a painting called The Adoration of the Magi. Although a lucrative commission, Leonardo left the painting unfinished. This was to be a pattern that continued throughout Leonardo's life, with many of his commissions being left unfinished and resulting in a number of lawsuits. Perhaps some insight into why Leonardo did this is a comment that Leonardo made in his notebooks, where he said, To conceive an idea is noble. To execute the work is servile. It's as if finishing the painting in Leonardo's head was enough for him, and once he had done that, it no longer stimulated him to continue. It's this philosophy that potentially led Leonardo to leave Florence and head for Milan in 1481. Located in the northern part of Italy, Milan was always on the brink of war with France or the Ottoman Empire, and Leonardo wanted to spend more time designing his war machines, rather than executing what he considered to be the subservient work of painting. This is where we get what I consider to be one of the most fascinating insights into who Leonardo da Vinci was. Upon leaving Florence for Milan, Leonardo wrote to Ludovico Sforza, who was the acting Duke of Milan, and offered his services. Now... Keep in mind that this is Leonardo da Vinci, probably the most famous painter of all time, certainly painted the most famous painting of all time, and this was his self-written resume. Most illustrious Lord, having now sufficiently considered the specimens of all those who proclaim themselves skilled contrivers of instruments of war, and that the invention and operation of the said instruments are nothing different from those in common use. I shall endeavour, without prejudice to anyone else, to explain myself to your excellency, showing your lordship my secrets, and then offering them to your best pleasure and approbation, to work with effect at opportune moments on all those things which, in part, shall be briefly noted below. 1. I have a sort of extremely light and strong bridges, adapted to be most easily carried, and with them you may pursue and at any time flee from the enemy, and others... Secure and indestructible by fire and battle. Easy and convenient to lift and place. Also, methods of burning and destroying those of the enemy. Two, I know how, when a place is besieged, to take the water out of the trenches and make endless variety of bridges and covered ways and ladders and other machines pertaining to such expeditions. Three, if, by reason of the height of the banks or the strength of the place and its position, it is impossible when besieging a place, to avail oneself of the plan of bombardment, 
I have methods for destroying every rock or other fortress, even if it were founded on a rock. Again, I have kinds of mortars, most convenient and easy to carry. And with these, I can fling small stones, almost resembling a storm. And with the smoke of these, cause great terror to the enemy, to his great detriment and confusion. 5. If the fight should be at sea, I have kinds of many machines, most efficient for offense and defense, and vessels which will resist an attack of the largest guns and powder and fumes. 6. I have means by secret and tortuous minds and ways, made without noise, to reach a designated spot, even if it were needed to pass under a trench or a river. 7. I will make covered chariots, safe and unattackable, which, entering among the enemy with their artillery, there is no body of men so great that would break them, and behind these, infantry could follow quite unhurt and without any hindrance. 8. In case of need, I will make big guns, mortars, and light ordnance of fine and useful forms, out of the common type. 9. Where the operation of bombardment might fail, I would contrive catapults, mongonels, trebocchi, and other machines of marvellous efficacy and not in common use, and in short, according to the variety of cases, I can contrive various and endless means of offence and defence. 10. In times of peace, I believe I give perfect satisfaction and to the equal of any other in architecture and the composition of buildings, public and private, and in guiding water from one place to another. 11. I can carry out sculpture in marble, bronze or clay, and also... I can do in painting whatever may be done, as well as any other, be he who he may. And, if any of the above-named things seem to anyone to be impossible or not feasible, I am most ready to make the experiment in your park, or in whatever place may please your excellency, to whom I comment myself with the utmost humility. Now, this is the great Leonardo da Vinci we're talking about, the artist of the most famous painting in the world. We'll have a bit more on the Mona Lisa later on. But I struggled to get my head around the fact that on his resume of his top 10 skills and abilities, painting is 11th. It would be like Leonardo living today and not even really including the fact that he's an artist in his LinkedIn profile. The Duke of Milan didn't quite agree with Leonardo's classification, however, as his reputation as an artist somewhat preceded him. Leonardo was hired by Sforza, but Sforza took him up on offer number 11 on that list and commissioned him to paint a picture of his wife. This painting became Lady with an Ermine, another of Leonardo's most famous works. The painting is revolutionary, as it's the first portrait in which the artist expresses the subject's thoughts or feelings through posture and gestures. The lady in the painting is looking to the right, as if distracted by something off to the side. The animal she's holding looks tense and alert. In this painting, we can see Leonardo's exploration into human psychology. As Dr. Stephen Campbell of Johns Hopkins University says, It relates to a series of interests being pursued by Leonardo about the motions of the mind. As the mind moves, so the body expresses the motions of the mind. Or as Leonardo would say, it's where the movements of the soul make themselves most manifest. This shows Leonardo's drive to understand as much as possible about the subject that he was interested in. He wasn't satisfied with simply painting someone as they looked. He recognised that in order to give the painting life, he would have to tap into the subject's thoughts and feelings. I'll put up a photo of everything that I mentioned in today's podcast at easygoingdigital.com.au slash individuate. So check out today's episode page if you want to have a look at some of the paintings while I'm describing them. The painting was received by Sforza, an overwhelming success. And although it wasn't what he came to Milan for, Leonardo recognised that staying close to Sforza was his best option. Before long, his decision paid off, as Sforza had commissioned from Leonardo a giant bronze horse to celebrate his father. The horse was to be 24 foot high and made from 60 tonnes of bronze project was an absolutely immense and career-making opportunity for Leonardo, then in his early 30s. Again, this project gives us great insight into the psychology of Leonardo. He began studying horses obsessively and devoted more than 12 years to the project, studying horses in incredible detail in order to be able to take on the great challenge. 
In order to create this giant horse, Leonardo would have to dig a giant pit in order to be able to dig a mould and then cast a bronze sculpture upside down in the ground. In the area around Milan, the water table was just over 24 foot below the earth. Now, I'm not an environmental scientist, but it doesn't take someone of Leonardo's genius to know the potentially disastrous effects of pouring molten bronze into the water table. So Leonardo was working with incredibly tight margins. This seems symbolic of Leonardo. He was working at the absolute limit of what he was capable of at all times and felt that he could overcome just about any obstacle. He later wrote in his notebooks, Obstacles cannot crush me. Every obstacle must yield to stern resolve. He whose gaze is fixed upon a distant star will not falter. This seems to be some of the essence of Leonardo's genius. He was never limited by what others had done before him or what other people thought was achievable. Unfortunately for Leonardo, however, he faced a significant obstacle getting his horse built. Milan was on the brink of war with France and the 60 tonnes of bronze that was set aside for Leonardo's statue was repurposed for the war effort. He was not able to complete his project and although he was to receive another commission soon after, as we'll find out soon, this failure stung Leonardo. The commission that he received after the failed horse was for a painting at the refectory of the convent of Santa Maria della Grazia. This painting, The Last Supper, is one of Leonardo's most recognisable works. I'm sure you've seen The Last Supper, maybe even in person, and it seems to me that you can read a whole lot into this painting. There's countless videos on the meaning and the hidden meaning of The Last Supper, so I won't dive too deep into why this painting is so special. But there's a couple of points that I want to make for our purposes. The first is something that I think relates to the creative curve that we spoke about in episode 9. I think The Last Supper shows how Leonardo was able to sit right at the sweet spot of the creative curve in terms of familiarity and novelty. Like most, if not all, of Leonardo's other work, The Last Supper was revolutionary. Previous depictions of Last Supper from the time had painted the moment of the First Holy Communion, or the Eucharist, when Jesus broke the bread with his disciples. However, Leonardo chose to paint a much more chaotic scene. The way each of the subjects expressed authentic and intense thoughts and emotions with their gestures is rarely seen in any fine art, let alone from that time period. Leonardo chose to further break from convention and paint Judas on the same side of the table as Jesus, whereas previous depictions had him on the opposite side of the table, signifying him as the traitor. The way Leonardo painted created a barrier between our world and the world of Jesus and his disciples, enhancing the divinity of the scene. Leonardo is able to paint Jesus' divinity without any explicitly divine symbols, like a halo or angel wings. These innovations were revolutionary for art at the time and contribute to why this painting is still spoken about today. But there were a couple of decisions that Leonardo made painting The Last Supper that shows he recognises the need for familiarity as well. The Last Supper shows a deep understanding for the material in the Bible. However, Leonardo chose to paint The Last Supper as if it was taking place at the time when it was painted keeping in mind that it was painted in the room where the monks of the convent would have their meals, he chose to paint Jesus and the disciples with similar linen and utensils to that that the monks would have used. Although he was painting a scene from more than a thousand years before, he chose to paint the scene with figures sitting rather than eating reclined as they would have in Jesus' time. Although the Last Supper contains countless innovations such as those I mentioned before, as the monks sat there eating, contemplating the themes encapsulated in Leonardo's painting, they would have done so in their own context, as if Jesus and his disciples were really sitting there at the end of the room. The only thing separating them is the divinity of Jesus and his disciples. The other point to make about the Last Supper is that it shows the limits of Leonardo's genius. It was his constant experimentation with human psychology and biology that allowed him to paint with such realism but it's his experimentation with oil and tempera that leaves us with such a faded version of the painting today. Instead of painting on the wet plaster as other frescoes were done at the time, Leonardo chose to experiment 
by painting on dry plaster with what was basically a mixture of coloured pigment, water and egg yolk. Tragically, the paint never fully adhered to the wall and despite the effort to restore and save it, we don't see the vibrancy of colour that Leonardo would have seen when he was finally able to admire the finished work three years after he'd begun. Unfortunately for Leonardo, not long after the completion of the Last Supper, Milan was invaded by French forces. Leonardo had lost his patron, and the giant clay model of the horse he had made in anticipation for the bronze casting was destroyed. Leonardo left Milan and began wandering. Although he was unemployed, it was around this time that he wrote in his diaries, It has long since come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely sit back and let things happen to them. They go out and make things happen. After having his services rejected in Venice, including a proposal for a way to conduct underwater warfare in the Venetian canals, he returned to Florence, determined to carry on his development and career. When he returned, things were not quite how he left them, however, as although he still had quite a reputation as a master craftsman, the people of Florence had been quite taken by a young upstart sculptor by the name of Michelangelo. Now, it suffice to say, Leonardo and Michelangelo didn't get along. I'm semi-shattered by this, as it would be incredible to imagine being a fly on the wall if these two ever collaborated. But it's important to note just how competitive they would have been. Artists in Florence at the time would compete with each other for commissions, so in many ways, they were incentivized to despise each other. History has recorded a meeting between the two where Leonardo was having a discussion with his friend, Giovanni di Gavina, as they were passing the bank house in Florence one day. As they were walking, Leonardo and his friend encountered a group of intellectuals discussing a Bible passage about Dante. They asked Leonardo's opinion. At that moment, Michelangelo happened to show up, and the group called him over too. Feeling that he was a little bit put on the spot, Leonardo cheekily said, Michelangelo will be able to tell you what it means. Michelangelo, feeling Leonardo's hostility, said, Explain it yourself, horse modeler. Unable to cast a statue in bronze, you were forced to give up the attempt. And he walked away. Michelangelo's reference to the failed bronze horse hurt Leonardo, and he despised Michelangelo the rest of his life, even though he respected him. I think there's an important point here to make about the shadow side something that's central to the theme of individuation that we spoke about in episode two. We'll explore this a little bit more once we get through the creative process for starting a podcast so that you have a vehicle to pursue these themes for yourself. But it's fascinating to note Leonardo's descriptions of Michelangelo as he explicitly described what seems like the opposite version of himself. Leonardo thought of Michelangelo as being tough, disheveled and arrogant. He even wrote of Michelangelo in his diary. The sculptor's face is covered with paste and all powdered with marble dust so that he resembles a baker. His house is dirty and filled with chips and dust of stone. With the painter, it's just the opposite. Well dressed, sitting easily in front of his work and moving a very light brush. His home is filled with music, unspoiled by the pounding of hammers. I think this passage is really interesting insight too into why we don't see more sculpture from Leonardo. As I said before, Verrocchio, Leonardo's master, was himself an apprentice to Donatello, one of the most famous sculptors of all time. So I think it's quite interesting that we don't see more sculpture from Leonardo, but perhaps this passage gives us insight into why. I find it fascinating that despite his immense genius, Leonardo wasn't able to transcend his hatred of Michelangelo, as it seems Michelangelo carried himself in a way that Leonardo felt he wasn't able to. Perhaps fearing direct competition for commissions with Michelangelo, Leonardo's desire to work on war machines led him to Cesare Borgia, a brutal figure who would become the primary inspiration for Machiavelli's The Prince. Leonardo worked for Borgia as a military architect and engineer, one thing that's fascinating from this time period is Leonardo's ability to draw bird's eye maps in the time before technology existed to get a bird's eye view. Again, I'll put up some of these on the podcast page for today because it's incredible the accuracy of these maps, particularly when overlaid with satellite imagery. 
He created his maps by meticulously measuring lengths and angles and creating what was essentially a scale model of a city, but viewed two-dimensionally from above. These maps show the mathematical genius that Leonardo possessed and the mastery of geometry that he was able to call upon for his paintings. In 1503, after about a year, Leonardo left Borgia, who had murdered three of his own captains, including one of Leonardo's friends. And so it seems that Leonardo was put off his desire for military pursuits. After leaving Borgia, Leonardo returned to Florence where he rejoined the Guild of St. Luke and continued his work as an artist. There's an incredible tidbit from this time in Florence when Leonardo and Michelangelo both lived there. And I'll put up the source for this on the podcast page for today because I couldn't quite believe it. But it's well known that Michelangelo's David is carved from a flawed block of stone. The reason David is looking to his left is because there wasn't enough stone to carve David facing forward as his nose would have been too short. According to Carla Padretta, director of the Armand Hammer Center at the University of California, the first artist to take a crack at the marble which was to become David was Leonardo da Vinci. After being in the hands of a private collector for over a hundred years, a purchase of some of Leonardo's notebooks in the year 2000 led to the discovery that the block of marble used for David had originally intended to be a giant sculpture of Hercules that Leonardo had begun in 1498 but had never finished. I just think that's pretty cool. In an indirect way, it was Leonardo's failure that created Michelangelo. I'm sure his talent would have led him to become prominent at some stage, but if there was no marble to carve David, would Michelangelo have gotten the commission for the Sistine Chapel ceiling? Maybe. But it's an interesting point, I think, anyway. It was at this time, upon his return to Florence in 1503, that Leonardo is said to have begun his most famous work, the Mona Lisa. It's unknown who the subject of the Mona Lisa is, but Giorgio Vasari, the first ever biographer of Renaissance painters, including Leonardo, himself a decorated artist who was born when Leonardo was nearly 60, said it was Lisa Gioconda, the wife of an Italian merchant. It's for this reason that the Mona Lisa is referred to as La Gioconda in Italy or La Gioconde in France today. Although interestingly, in France and Italy, this is also a pun as it refers to Lisa Gioconda, but it also means the jovial one. Vasari, however, never saw the painting and Leonardo never left a clue as to the subject. Now, there's a couple of things I want to mention about the Mona Lisa because it really is the accumulation of Leonardo's knowledge and experience that he'd gained throughout his life. If we go back to Alan Gannett's Four Laws of the Creative Curve, the Mona Lisa is really the prototypical example of going through that process. At first glance, the Mona Lisa seems strikingly simple, even plain compared to some of Leonardo's other work. It's certainly not as chaotically expressive as The Last Supper or some of his other paintings, but on closer inspection, you realise it's really nothing like his other paintings. Or for that matter, any other painting that had ever really been painted before it, or since. In Leonardo's time, artists would have been expected to perform autopsies on bodies in order to properly study anatomy. Leonardo literally cut up hundreds of bodies and took copious amounts of notes and anatomical drawings in order to accurately map out the mechanisms of the human body in intricate detail. It's interesting to note here that the way that we view anatomical drawings today is heavily influenced by the way Leonardo drew them. And it was Leonardo himself who first discovered the condition arterial sclerosis by comparing the heart of a deceased older man to that of a child. It was through this study of anatomy and biology that Leonardo was able to create the best psychological portrait of all time. The Mona Lisa is drawn with a triangular composition that was popular in the Renaissance. This provides a clear centre of focus and draws us in towards her face. It was the earliest Italian portrait to focus on the sitter in a three-quarter pose rather than full length. This style became the norm for 400 years after Leonardo pioneered it, but for its day, it was groundbreaking. He fills the frame with his subject, making the painting more intimate and cutting down on distractions for the viewer, again drawing you into her face. Paintings of the day were usually painted with a monotone background, like a plain sky or a simple room. However, Mona Lisa is sitting in front of a complicated landscape that seems to have only existed in Leonardo's mind. 
as you get further towards the background, it blurs, creating what's called aerial perspective, a technique that was invented by Leonardo in this painting. This technique mirrors the way our eyes perceive the world in real life. Leonardo invented other techniques that became commonplace too. His technique called chiaroscuro was created by contrasting light and dark tones to give the illusion of three dimensions. The way he actually painted Mona Lisa was new too, inventing a technique called sfumato, meaning smoky, in which tiny amounts of pigment were added to water and painstakingly applied in many, many thin layers. Again, this technique mimics the way our eyes work tonally which allowed for depth of field never seen in a painting before the Mona Lisa. The subject is stripped of any high-class status symbols, wearing only a plain black gown, something that would not have been seen in other art of this time, which was mainly commissioned to celebrate opulence and wealth. Again, this is so that none of it's there to distract away from the face, which is the primary part of the painting. Now this is where it gets incredible. The horizon in the background behind the Mona Lisa doesn't quite match up, as it's skewed slightly higher to her left. This is because Leonardo knew that our brains would struggle with the conflicting information and correct this, which makes it look like her shoulders are on a slant, when in fact they're not. Our brain corrects this and gives the illusion of movement, as if the figure is slightly shuffling within its frame. Arguably, Mona Lisa's most famous feature is her smile. It was only relatively recently that we were able to explain scientifically why Mona Lisa's smile is so intriguing. It was in using these techniques of chiaroscuro and sfumato that Leonardo created an optical illusion. When we look at her eyes, the shading around her mouth appears to suggest that the mouth is curved upward. But when looking at the mouth, you realise that it's not quite a smile. This gives the illusion that she's both smiling and not smiling, depending on where you look. This gives the painting extra life and movement, as if she's a real person, changing her expression and really communicating with you. The fact that Leonardo was able to do all this with a paintbrush is kind of astounding, but it was only through Leonardo's dissections of the human body, and particularly the eye, that he learned that light hits the whole retina at once, and this affects the way that we perceive light. Leonardo was able to use this knowledge to his advantage, giving the painting extra life and movement that simply wouldn't have been possible without the incredibly vast skill set and knowledge that Leonardo possessed. Before the Mona Lisa, artists only represented outward appearances or representations of the persona, as Jung would say. But Mona Lisa really is relatively like a living person. The optical illusions created by Leonardo gave her movement that was never seen in painting before. He blended anatomy, geometry, psychology, biology, geology, philosophy, and many more fields of study to create art that wasn't just art. It was a deeper exploration into the human experience. According to art curator James Payne, when you stand in front of the Mona Lisa, you're looking at more than a portrait of an individual. You're looking at the accumulated knowledge of a genius who blended art, science, and magic to create a profound meditation on what it is to be human. Whether she's Mona Lisa, La Gioconda, or La Gioconde, she's the face of a revolution in art. That's pretty much where we'll leave Leonardo da Vinci's life for today. To quickly close off the story, he spent the rest of his life working in a largely ceremonial role for the King of France. The Mona Lisa accompanied Leonardo for the rest of his life, and in his mid-60s, Leonardo suffered a stroke, leaving his right side paralysed and his left hand unable to draw the fine detail that he once could. Leonardo died in 1519 in France, the Mona Lisa left unfinished by his side. He was a rare human, not motivated by wealth or popularity. He measured his success in how he felt about his own achievements. Just before he took his final breath, It's said that when Leonardo uttered his final words, he said, I have offended God and mankind, for my work did not reach the quality it should have. Bloody tough critic, if you ask me. So, that's about all we've got for today's podcast. 
there's just a couple of brief points that I want to make to tie some of this stuff back into the central themes of the podcast. First of all, what seems abundantly clear is that Leonardo was not just a genius, but a visionary. He painted at a time when they didn't have a regular way of telling the time, for goodness sake. But as time's gone on, we've come to see how Leonardo was literally centuries ahead of his contemporaries. Now, there's an element to all this which is a little bit ironic, because after all that, I think there actually was something special about Leonardo that potentially the rest of us don't quite have access to. He stood out in Verrocchio's workshop at what was arguably the greatest time in the history of art. He comfortably sits in the pantheon of great artists of all time. I would even say the pantheon of all creatives. But there are certainly elements of Leonardo that we can ourselves emulate. If we go back to that idea from Steve Jobs, that creativity is about connecting things, it seems to me that Leonardo's ability to be creative came from possessing an incredibly vast array of knowledge. It was only through his countless hours dissecting bodies that he learned how the muscles in the face each contributed towards a smile. And we know from his notebooks that his autopsies helped him to map out the nerves of the face, allowing him to exactly understand how the physiology of a smile is created. This then allowed him to create the illusion of Mona Lisa's smile because he was coming from a place of such intricate understanding. It seems that it was Leonardo's insatiable curiosity that allowed him to take in so much knowledge. It's as if he was constantly engaged, and his copious research and note-taking allowed him to expand and organise his thoughts. For example, his interest in nature and physics allowed him to understand and paint movement better than anyone who'd ever come before him. A painting created by one of Leonardo's apprentices, the Salvatore Mundi, sold at auction in 2018. It was initially thought to be an original Leonardo simply because no one else in history has ever been able to paint the dynamic movement of bouncy curly hair like Leonardo. It was later found out that this is the only part of the painting that was completed by Leonardo and the painting's value has had hundreds of millions of dollars wiped off since. Literally no one else in history has been able to emulate the particular skill and creative talent that Leonardo had. But Leonardo didn't just intuit all of his knowledge. He had a process for learning it. For example, he was a master at painting objects in different light. However, he used to practice this by draping a crumpled sheet over a chair and sketching the shadows in the candlelight. Then, without disrupting the sheet, he would reposition the candles so that the angle of the shadows created an entirely different composition. He would then recreate the process until he was satisfied that he understood the intricacies of that particular arrangement totally. Then, he would change the position of the sheet and start the whole thing again. So, although he was a genius, clearly possessing an incredible amount of natural talent, he also had a process for becoming a genius, one that we can at least take bits and pieces from. I'll give the final word on Leonardo to his close friend, Francis I. Some 20 years after Leonardo's death, Francis was reported by the goldsmith and sculptor, Benvenuto Cellini, as saying, There had never been another man born in the world who knew as much as Leonardo, not so much about painting, sculpture and architecture, as that he was a very great philosopher. So that's it for today's podcast about Leonardo da Vinci. We've only really scratched the surface today. But I think there's lots in there that I'm keen to unpack a bit over the coming podcasts. As I said at the start of the podcast, Leonardo is the prototypical creative in many ways, and we can definitely learn a lot about how the absolute best go about it. Next week, I'm keen to have a bit more of a look at the consumption element of creativity, because it seems to me there's a way that we can speed up the consumption side of things, so that we don't need to take two decades like Rodin. We can look at things more like an apprenticeship, like Leonardo, who had seemingly mastered all there is to do in art by the age of 20. But more on that next week. Check out the podcast page for today at www.easygoingdigital.com.au slash individuate. You can catch today's episode page and all the other episode pages up there too. I'll put up all my sources for today, including some really interesting videos, like a TED talk about Leonardo that I've geeked out on a bit in the past. But that's all I've got for now. Thanks so much for spending some time with me today. I look forward to doing it again on the next episode.
of Individuate.